Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the second session of Maker Explorer. Today, we have uh, Adam Carver from BitGreen discussing their team's initiative to be the leader in the blockchain space for ESG solutions. Uh, with that, we'll hand it over to Adam. Thanks a lot, everyone. Uh, buenos dias, bon dia, and good morning. I'm Adam, and I'm the CEO of BitGreen, based here, uh, based in New York. And really, really excited to have this conversation with you. I've read uh, Rune's blog posts, listened to his podcast and uh, on Bankless, and then also kind of read a lot of uh, the material that's been posted in the MakerDAO forums and spoken to some of your team. And I feel like there's a strong alignment between our two organizations and where we're aiming to go. So I'll give a little brief today on Bitcream, but I'm, we're really going to talk about what it's going to take for the crypto community to be a catalyst to help the world cross the carbon chasm. So the agenda for today's discussion is, I'm gonna to try to right-size this climate problem so that at any point in the future, when you start thinking about the magnitude of what we actually face as a global community, you can always come back to this one presentation. And I hope that that's one of the salient takeaways that you're able to leave today with. I'm going to share a little bit of what else is happening in crypto land and other blockchain projects uh, within sustainability. I'll introduce Bitgreen and I'll try to add a little bit of levity and tell some jokes so that at the end of the conversation, we don't all want to just hide under our beds, that we're inspired to actually take action and uh, be brave in what is really a daunting problem ahead of us. A little bit about me. I've been working in startups and tech for about the last decade, a little bit in venture capital, I led business development and investor relations at AngelList, and I did my master's degree in sustainable systems and in, uh, energy systems at the University of Michigan about 10 years ago. So this idea of Big Green is very much a culmination of my education and what I've been doing over the past 10 to 15 years. And a bit about Big Green. So we're, we're a purpose-driven chain that is specifically built for ESG and impact. The aim here is to be a North Star that helps to organize resources, people, and ideas around utilizing cryptocurrency and blockchain technology on behalf of the environment. We try to avoid this rhetorical question of like, what is the role of sustainability within crypto? That's like asking what's the role of sustainability within energy or banking or the political sphere? And that discussion very often just ends up at a dead end. Instead, we try to ask the question, what can crypto do for sustainability? How can we leverage this technology and our collective resources and energy on behalf of a real world issue that desperately needs our attention. Uh, this, or this, BitGreen, um, we started thinking about this idea in early 2021 and then development began in earnest over the summer. We were a remote team of nine or 10, we're kind of hiring every day now, looking for developers and other resources. We raised uh, $5 million in the fastest ever crowdfund to 5 million in history a couple of weeks ago on Republic. And our aim is to be uh, ultimately to participate in a parachain auction to become a parachain on the Polkadot network. So here are some of the rationale and assumptions underlying our core business and how I tend to think about climate change and ecological degradation. So <laughs> this slide kind of says it all. Like we all, I, I believe that most of us have an underlying feeling of discontent that the world is just not okay. And maybe we're unable to actually diagnose what that is and put our thumb on it but there seems to be just this ubiquitous and pervasive sense that we're moving, in some ways, we're moving in the wrong direction. And I enumerated a, a bunch of issues here that we're all pretty aware of, particularly around the environment, climate change and species extinction, waste and garbage, kind of a food system that feels as though it's a bit toxic. There's issues with public health, poverty and infrastructure. The one that I really want to highlight here is the erosion of public trust, and that's the trust in our public institutions. And that erosion actually seeps down into how we behave as a culture and communities and how we organize. And what it ultimately results in is a declining sense of personal agency. When people feel helpless, they don't feel that they have agency in their lives or in the communities in which they exist. And they become numb to the pain around them and complacent to the fact that something needs to change. And beyond just creating technological solutions to climate change and other issues at hand, the larger problem that I think that Big Green and all of us need to contemplate is how do we try to restore 
a personal and abiding sense in each individual sense of agency to take uh, to create a better world and create a better life for themselves and their families. Um, I really wanted to add this one. <clears throat> so the Pew Research did a study uh, two years ago. They asked people what's their interest in helping the environment. 70% of the people reported of wanting to protect the environment in their daily lives, yet only 20% said that they live out that intention day to day. And again, I think this comes back to agency and how we actually incentivize people to achieve the type of outcomes that we want to see. But today we're primarily here to talk about carbon. Why is that? So <clears throat> for better or for worse, carbon is the best proxy that we have when we discuss environmental exploitation. It's actually quite frustrating for people in the environmental sphere because we're deconstructing environmental exploitation into just one molecule. Now that molecule is crucially important because as a greenhouse, ga greenhouse gas, it's what is basically propelling climate change. But I would challenge all of us to think not only about carbon and carbon dioxide, but, or carbon and carbon dioxide, but instead, like what are the other issues that we have to deal with if we only focus on carbon, but we ignore, call it species extinction, then we haven't really ended up in a better place. Although, you know, we've solved one problem. We're a bit playing whack-a-mole for the variety of different problems that humanity has to encounter and confront over the next decades. And I mean, this is this is the graph that matters the most. Um, so we we basically are able to run simulations, or actually, I shouldn't even say simulation. We're actually able to run regressions that demonstrates a proportionate increase in atmospheric temperature to the proportion of carbon dioxide molecules parts per million in the atmosphere. And the way that scientists are able to do is they basically take uh, they bore into ice in the Arctic and into Antarctica. And they measure the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that's stored in the ice against known reading, known understanding of what the temperature of the planet was. And we can just, we can basically see that something, see here that something is drastically off with this graph. And what's the significance of 350? You've probably heard this number before. Um, James Hansen, who is a famous NASA scientist, he was the first scientist to report, or basically to testify in front of Congress in the US in the late 1980s, it was in 1988, he was the person who kind of coined the phrase of global warming and reported this to Congress. Here we are almost 35, 40 years later, and we're still talking about this. Uh, in, 20, in 2008, he wrote that life on Earth is adapted to a, to a certain atmospheric percentage of carbon dioxide. And the significance here, what's really important is that as we deviate from this percentage of carbon dioxide and we change the factors in the very kind of the mix of uh, molecules in the air in our ecosystem, it compromises and really jeopardizes our ability to continue living on this planet. Um, the 350 parts per million is equated to about a 1.5 degree increase in uh, degrees Celsius increase in temperature, but that's kind of a Pollyanna um, assessment because positive feedback loops make this somewhat unrealistic. And here we see um, a forecast of atmospheric parts per million in the atmosphere based on several scenarios. The green case is, the, is business as usual. The best case scenario, which is this like 350 is in pink. The Hansen model is a little bit outdated at this point, um, although it, you know, it's hopeful. And we can see the safety threshold is way, way below the point that we already are. And this is where we are today at about 415, 416 parts per million. So as before I began learning about this, I was thinking about this problem completely wrong. And most people who I discuss are also thinking about this problem completely wrong. And by the way, what I, what I love as an aside, what I love about this picture of the pigeon is that the pigeon did this to himself. Right? He, he literally self-inflicted this problem by pecking for food and then does not have the ability on his own to actually remove this leaf from his face that he can see. And to me, that's by quite a powerful metaphor for humanity and climate change. So this is <clears throat> what we need to be thinking about. Carbon dioxide is going to continue to climb. If we absolutely stop burning fossil fuels and then releasing greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. It's a bit like pouring blue ink into a bathtub. 
even if we reduce our carbon output, even if we begin to increase the mix of, let's say, our energy capacity and introducing more renewables, the carbon, di the carbon dioxide parts per million will not decrease and will continue to, to uh, advance or propel global warming until the ink actually comes out of the bathtub. So until we go to a net zero place where we're sequestering as much carbon as we're actually releasing into the atmosphere, and we begin to take carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases out of the air, we will continue to see that perpetuation of global warming that I showed you in the previous graph. And the financial deficit here is far beyond this, the magnitude that most people think. Uh, there are something called the UN Sustainable Development Goals that set a target for 2030. We're at approximately a $50 trillion deficit to actually invest in the infrastructure necessary to actualize those goals within the next eight years. And to put that into a bit of context or relative context to crypto, so on the left-hand side, you see the um, $3 trillion is about where we are in the total market cap of all cryptos versus the $50 trillion, which is the SDG shortfall in the next eight years. And then to put that into even greater context, if we think about, like we all celebrate DeFi and it's exponential, almost mercurial growth in the past 20 months. We're at about $100 billion in DeFi TVL. We have about a $4 trillion annual shortfall to reach these UN sustainability, uh, sust uh, sustainable development goals within the next eight, nine, 10 years. So we have a few assumptions at Bitgreen that are necessary to cross this carbon chasm. The first is we need to think at a different magnitude and scale. We need to begin contemplating what it means to actually raise trillions of dollars and not billions. When we have discussions in the billions, that's kids play relative to this problem. The second assumption is that sustainable assets, in our opinion, they need to be separated from real assets as a category and as a group. And I'll discuss this more later, but contemplating how we wanna focus on renewable energy and renewable or zero or net zero energy mobility and other technologies that are necessary to actually get humanity to where it needs to be, we can't begin to measure those assets and their return on investment in the same way that we measure and then strategize around like large buildings or bridges and other infrastructure projects. Like this sustainability needs to be its own category. And the third assumption here is that carbon either becomes the most valuable commodity in the world or we're fucked. And it needs to be as valuable or more valuable than gold. It may be Bitcoin and other commodities that exist, that exist in, the, in global trade. Otherwise, we're just not going to get there. And I think that Chamath actually um, and others have echoed this, that the world's first trillionaire is going to be made in climate change. And what he's really emphasizing as well is that this is a business and an economic opportunity. It's not purely philanthropic or a fire drill. So let's get a little bit to um, crypto and then Bitcoin. So our strategy here and our, our abiding mission is that, you know, we, again, we believe impact requires its own purpose-built infrastructure, that this is not, that this problem is so ubiquitous and large and interconnecting, and its participants are so diverse that it is, un, that we will under-deliver and it will be unfulfilled if it's simply a constellation of different dApps built across multiple different uh, layer one blockchains that may or may not interconnect. And so we've taken the position that we were gonna build a parachain on top of Polkadot so that we can share in security and um, other benefits of the Polkadot network. And then also be able to define exactly a sovereign governance structure as well as economic incentives that are designed, specifically designed to achieve the type of outcomes that we are looking to accomplish. So <clears throat> that means strategy, determining our strategy as a protocol through a singular lens, and that is sustainability and impact. Um, that on a financial basis, that the applications, that the application layer built on top of Bitgreen, and then the initiatives that people will want to pursue on top of Bitgreen have competition amongst themselves, amongst other impact projects, not impact versus non-impact, not 
renewable energy versus like Ford AP Yacht Club, right? And we also have an underlying assumption here that is driving our strategy that the customers who care, the customers and users who care about sustainability and impact are ultimately the same. And that many of the applications, albeit that they may be unique in their own structure from NGO to NGO or NGO to carbon credits, actually have a lot of common language and a lot of common currency amongst them. The other major reason why we're pursuing our own chain is kind of what we call the tragedy of the commons of Ethereum. And we're all familiar with the tragedy of the commons. And that fundamentally though, is that <clears throat> general purpose blockchains, they're susceptible to the same commons game strategy as we see in the real world. And actually as the myth of the commons illustrates, we see that in gas fees on Ethereum right now, where the hegemons, which are really um, the miners and the application layer of DeFi, as well as uh, NFTs are driving up costs and are basically, in, or in many ways, are like suffocating and consuming all the resources so that there's not enough oxygen for others to participate, particularly smaller players. And this will be very, very true as we begin to discuss participants or individuals or groups that want to participate in crypto, but are unable to do, so, but they're from smaller economies and they're unable to actually participate in some of the general purpose blockchains that exist. This also kind of exists in Bitcoin with mining and elsewhere. So <clears throat> there are just undesirable outcomes that result when any type of system is set up with the, out with the goal of purely being money. And so we believe that saving the planet requires its own game and its own structure on built directly into the protocol layer. So we're, <clears throat> we're focused primarily on two applications to start. One of them is carbon credits. And before I get into what we're doing, I'll just give you this landscape slide of kind of our research um, of all the other kind of impact players within crypto. And some of these are not in offsets or carbon necessarily. Like for microfinance, there's Goldfinch. Um, there are a variety of other kind of like unique, like NFTs necessarily aren't uh, carbon related. But what you can take away from this slide is that the bulk and the preponderance of all the effort is going into carbon in some, in some manner of speaking. It's clearly the low hanging fruit that most companies have identified. And also there are just not many, not many players here, right? I mean, of the ones, of the logos that are serious on the slide, maybe there are a dozen, like 10 or a dozen. These NFT projects are like kind of kitschy and fun and they've, they're good for actually getting media and articles, but they're just, they're too small. And if there was another layer here, like another filter that I would apply, how many of these logos can actually get us to, or contribute to getting humanity to that trillion dollar number or into the trillions? And the answer would be very, very few. It'd be a select few. You're probably familiar with ClimaDAO or ClimaDAO. So I want to discuss this very quickly. It's a really unique concept. They forked Olympus DAO. And then instead of providing um, cryptos like Ethereum as collateral uh, into the DAO, um, the bonds actually buy carbon credits called uh, base, carbon, base carbon tons, BCT. And they've actually, um, they've actually purchased about 12 million uh, carbon tons into the treasury already, which is really, apple, and it's gotten a lot of attention. There are a lot of artic lots of articles about this. The problem is that the price of the DAO has, has collapsed and there's a lot of questions around its feasibility as well as the quality of carbon credits that it actually buys because a carbon credit is not necessarily, the projects are not fungible. A carbon credit is not a, is not a, a carbon credit is not a carbon credit is not a carbon credit. Um, and this creates a, this actually creates a big problem in the, in the market. As well, like the Dow here, as you see, it has about a 40,000% annual APY. So what happens is that stakers earn the yield on staking and then they dump the coin, which then suppresses the price. And here's a criticism by, I would say like a pseudo sovereign fund that we talked about, that we talked to, or we've been talking to for a little while. And this person has been working in impact investing for a while. The crypto bros are rushing into the carbon market and they're gonna fill it with all the shittiest credits just to make a buck. And they're gonna ruin all the progress made by real environmentalists who will be left to clean up their mess. There's a big question of authenticity and honesty that I think we as Big Green 
and others who are going to wear this impact patch on our sleeves and wear our hearts on our sleeves as well, that we are doing this not for a buck, but that we're doing it because we really do believe in the mission and that this is our mission in life and that we're willing to work with environmentalists and other you know, impact investors who have been committing their entire lives and careers, ensuring that we're not doing anything that will cause some form of uh, like blotch on all the hard work that they've accomplished and all the territory they've gained. Um, holding aside Climate Dow, we actually think Cello is, is really legitimate in its attempt, uh, in, its, in its mission. And um, they have this thing called the Climate Collective where they've committed or said, they've set a target for actually um, holding 40% of the assets underlying stable Cello in climate, tokenized climate assets. And they've begun to make some progress on this. And we think it's really admirable. So now getting to Big Green. <clears throat> so we wanna create, uh, at least in carbon credits, uh, the product that we're innovating is that we wanna create a consensus driven and a compliant forward carbon contract. So this means that it would be a realized contract today that represents the forward looking carbon credits produced from a specific project in the future. That's drastically different from what's currently available in the market right now, which isn't all that innovative or interesting, but it, I understand why it exists, which are basically that like these carbon credits already exist out in the world. They're deemed commodities by the US CFTC. And then other projects like Toucan and Clima and others are tokenizing those existing carbon credits and then allowing them to trade or be retired on a chain. And that's a great idea. It's not really earth shaking, but, and I understand why, it, why they're doing so. It's not really changing the world in that those carbon credits are projects that are already funded. What we need to be focused on is driving new capital into projects that are undercapitalized or that are not going to be financed through traditional off-chain means. So what are like, what are kind of the attributes of this forward carbon contract? So number one is we're engaging with the SEC and the CFTC to make these contracts completely compliant. And then we hope by doing so, we can kind of stand in front of other crypto projects and shield them, if you will, from having to, from SEC oversight, and then providing kind of a conduit for other projects to work with us um, in a manner that is fully compliant with US regulation. And then obviously enables all of us to access US and European markets. Because if we really want asset managers and the large players to get involved in this market, then they're going to mandate that we actually do so in a compliant way. There's just not a way to circumvent US regulators if we wanna get the Harvard Endowment or the New York Teachers Pension Fund to begin investing billions of dollars in this market. Um, we plan on using consensus, and we'll talk a little bit about that in terms of the verification and certification of these credits. Um, this, these would be capacity building projects. And so the reason for creating forward contracts, almost like a future, is that project owners and landowners can actually get an upfront payment for their land in order to go through a verification process uh, in a manner that allows them to actually finance not only their own project, but then also take that financing and begin to buy up and um, instigate or, in, or start down the path of verification for other projects. It's capacity building to basically put money in the pockets of project originators now for a future promise of credits that will be generated in the future. On, the, on, that, um, on that point, the current carbon credits value chain is like incredibly messed up. And these are the five major, um, five major uh, milestones or activities that happen. Somebody owns land in the Amazon, they find a project originator who frankly is just a financier because this process is so expensive. They go out and they find uh, a verifier, somebody who's like an auditor who actually goes to the site, measures the diameter of the trees, counts the amount of trees in a specific area, then they do some rather simple calculations. After that, the audit then goes to a certifying body. <clears throat> and this is where the major bottleneck take play, takes place. Um, so that certification can require anywhere from six months, 12 months, 18 months, and it's prohibitively expensive. It might be $100,000, $200,000, it depends on the actual project scope. And that amount of time, as well as the money, is totally exclusionary to many of the communities, especially the local communities that are literally sitting on the land and own the land 
that needs to be protected. And then after certification, which really is a rubber stamp, those carbon credits go to the OTC market where there are like brokers and others who place them at companies and other buyers. The largest certifiers in the voluntary market are called, are Vera is one and gold standard is the other. Again, there are the certifiers here, the second, um, second to last box from the right. And there's a discussion right now amongst the crypto teams that are working in carbon credits, whether to try to go through and work with Vera and gold standard or to circumvent them and use a form of consensus driven uh, certification for the credits. It's just kind of up for debate. So a few reasons, a few other reasons why we're really focused on the forward contract. So number one is, as I was talking, it's capacity building. It creates these flywheels of financing that not only benefit one specific project, but then enable land owners to then go out and verify other potential projects and buy up more land to conserve more pristine territory that requires it. Um, the forward contract activates lending markets and finance markets in a way that carbon credits or tokenized existing carbon credits does not. So we can activate lending markets for land conservation, renewable energy. Most exciting here is creating lending markets for local communities and their micro economies, which really means jobs, right? So when these lands, if we can provide economic welfare and livelihood to the people who live on these lands, then they may not be compelled to slash and burn some area of the Amazon in order to grow soybeans, in order to feed livestock that will become like tacos in the US, right? That's, that's the process that we're trying to assuage and protect against. Um, the forward contracts also allow all of this to happen on chain and then to trade on DEXs. And it also doing this on chain kind of reduces the fraud of double and triple counting credits. And what we can ultimately do is pay people to keep carbon in the ground and not to extract it. And if we're really looking for a diversified portfolio of carbon assets, then we need to begin thinking way beyond tokenized carbon credits. But we need to be thinking about innovative financial instruments that can ultimately be the collateral behind a stable coin that is fully focused on carbon sequestration and other impact assets. The second, the second app that we're looking, uh, that we're pursuing right now is an impact investing marketplace, which is very much kind of inspired by my work at AngelList. And just as a general, as general context, impact investing is already a huge market and it's growing year over year, but it's really dominated by large asset managers. <clears throat> but you see here kind of the other participants who tend to play uh, within impact investing. And this graph kind of tells you that, you know, over 80%, 85% of the market are large philanthropic donors or, or family offices, or I shouldn't say family office. It's either philanthropy or it's large asset managers and private equity. There are no existing rails for like retail or even some small family offices to get involved in this marketplace, which is really depressing as somebody who cares about the environment, just speaking for myself, and I'm sure for many people on this call, I would love to be able to take some of my retirement savings and discretionary income and put that into yield bearing projects that are actually creating a better world. And there's no way for me to do that other than maybe like buying Starbucks stock on a US exchange, which is a pretty pathetic outcome and not very rewarding. There's just no way for me to participate in this market and figuring we wanna change that. So this is a pretty simplistic flow chart. I'll show a better one next. But what we're thinking here is that we're gonna create a synthetic green bond market where there's a token that's representing, or basically the, the token is provides the access into a smart contract that has the liens to some off-chain real world asset that is impactful. So here, on, starting on the left-hand side, there would be an investor. That investor puts some <clears throat> a stable coin um, into the Bickering Impact Investing market that goes to a smart contract. Again, that's representing a contract that's made off-chain. There's, there's some collateral from that project that goes into a collateral pool, and there's an exchange of stable coin. It would be infeasible due to currency risk to actually make this a variable crypto. Um, in return, the investor receives a synthetic green bond that is kind of signified here by the big green logo and the circle. And now what's really compelling is that that investor can then take that token and then trade it on a secondary market. So here's a schematic of how the marketplace would actually work. I won't go through the flow here. You're probably very familiar with this because Maker does some similar things with, uh, with its other projects. 
But effectively, there's a borrower, borrower pool that we can kind of tranche out by risk. On the right-hand side are the lenders or the investors who are able to put liquidity into the pool and then receive a token that they can then go trade in a compliant secondary market. On the left-hand side are existing managers um, who are already investing in these impact projects and have track records. It would be infeasible for us as an entity to try to source projects and then vet all of them, right? So instead, our what we've been doing is we've been signing MOUs with existing managers who are very often undercapitalized and would be interested in bringing their existing projects to the Big Green, uh, to the Big Green platform. This is exactly how AngelList works, by the way. There's a syndicate lead, has an allocation in a deal. They bring it to AngelList as a marketplace, and then AngelList provides the liquidity, basically individual angel investors, who then fill that al allocation in the startup syndicate. And then kind of layered on top of this are a variety of different like risk assessment engines and then like oracles and other data feeds uh, that we want to build on chain and then make available and permissionless for other market participants to, to join in. So why is this absolutely crucial beyond just what we're doing with carbon credits? The only way to arrive at a trillion dollar market or a trillion dollar upper, or realize a trillion dollars in capital or more is to do so via a secondary market. A major impediment right now to impact investing writ large is that entities that are buying debt or that are buying debt or investing in large in renewable energy projects, microfinance, et cetera, have to hold that paper until maturity. So they're really suffering from the cost of liquidity and that's becoming a very large deterrent for those for bringing in new capital. Moreover, uh, the lack of a secondary market means there really is no price discovery of these investments. So again, there's currently no secondary market for impact investing. That's what's so crucial and what's so innovative here is that the smart contract mints a token and that token can trade on an open secondary market that can also welcome in bundlers, index makers, mutual funds, other risk assessors and analysts who may want to create large pools of assets for, um, for investors to participate in. And those investors can range anywhere from retail all the way to family offices, institutions, corporations, governments, et cetera. But we're really aiming here to bring in like endowment, pension, large institutional capital, as well as to do for impact investing what Robinhood did, which is to provide rails for retail investors. And I'm gonna wrap it up. So <clears throat> main point here is we need to think in the trillions and not in the billions. Otherwise, it's just putting kid gloves on a real problem. And most people that we speak to, almost everyone is thinking about this way too small. And then we need to ask ourselves, what are the risks and the models that we need to run to achieve an outcome that's maybe 10 to 100 times larger than what we would normally deem as a successful outcome or success normal, success normie. <laughs> and you know, we, we're big believers in Web3 and everyone on this call is, right? Uh, but there are other people out there who are gonna solve like the NFT issues and scalability on Ethereum and DeFi contracts. Like all of that is going to get solved. The only question is when and by whom and who's gonna get rich. But the real question that we have is like, who out there is gonna solve this problem that we're discussing on this call? And there are very few people who, who are trying to do so. And so my, my ask would be to be our partners on this, on this crusade. And let's try to make carbon the most valuable asset in the world. There are just too few of us. There are too few people in the world, too few teams that have the capability, the scalability, and then the willingness to actually tackle this problem of climate change head on. Like maybe there are a couple hundred teams, a couple thousand teams, but that's it. And so as Big Green as a team, like we've kind of embraced this as our mission and we are open to collaborating with any CU or any organization or group, even like other, you know, quote unquote, competitive layer ones and other crypto teams. We need to grow this pie as large as possible so that, um, and we'll all benefit from doing so and humanity will benefit. But it's going to require just more than, than capital. It will really require our courage and the best of us to step forward. And that's it.
Thank you all so much. Nice. Thank you, Adam. Uh, before yeah, we open it for, for questions and answers, I wanted to give a little bit of feedback for those ha that uh, who, or, or who have not been following um, along, but uh, Rune not long ago posted this um, forum post. I forgot the exact name, but it was like the case for clean money or, or something along those lines. Um, and the the premise behind that is that it's very hard, as I was saying, for for one uh, single individual to to try to have an impact on their daily lives. And the 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 premise of this is that if every every cash or every money uh, that's out there, and, and it doesn't need to be fiat, but uh, if every every single piece of money that's out there that's based on debt is based instead of uh, of good debt, so of, of on debt of projects that are trying to change something, uh, a single person just by asking for that would be having an impact because then you would be creating demand for that that would, uh, in its own like method, like push for for more supplies, so more projects would get get funded, etc. Um, so that that was the idea, a bit of SES to start these conversations and and to bring people like like you, Adam. So hopefully. Uh, you can help us uh, shape what this vision looks like. Uh, right now, we are not uh, entirely sure, and we're trying to figure it out. But uh, that's what we think that this is um, extremely important. And uh, my my first question, I'm going to jump uh, everyone in the in the queue. Uh, but I, I would like to. I, I don't know if there's anything that that we can follow any any kind of set of uh, of best practices or frameworks that we should be looking into. Is it if you were uh, to, I don't know, like, imagine you're our advisor or something along those lines, and you will have to help us for the next 15 minutes. Um, we can send you that, by the way. <laughs> but what, uh, what's, what, in which way should we framing this problem? In which way should we uh, ask the right questions and make sure that we're not just the crypto bros uh, trying to, to pump a market, but instead having a, a meaningful change that's actually long term? Is there, an, is there an easy way or at least a straight way to, to start in the right direction? Yeah, well, I do want to make assumptions about um, MakerDAO and your current operations and dynamic before I learn more. But if I had to, if I were to enter an organization similar to yours and just try to contemplate like what are, what are some, um, what are the compelling issues at hand that we need to have a discussion around? The first is, uh, <clears throat> not rolling up sustainability and impact into like real assets and other organizational objectives. So I personally believe that that needs to be at least its own silo or, or working group because we can't force um, like sustainability initiatives and the people who are working on them who are basically starting from scratch in many ways to then compete with like crypto punks and board ape you know, Board API Club, NFTs, and other existing revenue generating products, um, or like real other real assets such as stadiums and buildings and bridges, as I said. The, the return on investment for impact is drastically different than the return on investment for these other projects. And I don't mean just single bottom line financial, but it's double bottom line, in many cases, triple bottom line. It involves planet, people, and profit. And so I think that that requires its own, its own working group. Um, the other way I would say that is having worked on this for a while, I get the sense that impact and sustainability is a refugee, right? It literally just doesn't have a nation to go to. People talk about it being important, but there's really like no nation or economy that wants it, right? And so long as that situation persists where it's an afterthought or it's just like a value without any action or its own cost center or revenue center, then it will just continue to be a refugee that's looking for a home. That would be my number one. That'd be my, my number one uh, recommendation. Um, second would be, oh man, I kind of forgot the second because I got so tied up on the refugee thought. Uh, I think that, oh, second one, of course, again, comes back to the scale and magnitude question. Are the initiatives that we're undertaking or contemplating big enough. And so when you think about a $4 trillion deficit per year, for most organizations, 
hitting a billion dollars in market cap, like that's, that is the measure of a unicorn, right? Or driving a billion dollars of loans or even $10 billion. But $10 billion is one four hundredth of the annual deficit. And that deficit doesn't go away if we don't actually hit, hit it, um, achieve it by the end of the year. It just rolls over into successive years, it compounds, right? And as the planet gets hotter and there are more devastating effects of climate change and social and economic inequality, those are compounding effects, it's, it's exponential. And so when we think about solutions and we think about potentially like this could drive $5 billion into the market, it's just not big enough, right? Like we need to think about solutions that get to a trillion dollars. And to do that, therefore, like what is the philosophical discussion that needs to take place when we need to 10X or 100X our desired outcome? And I just say the third thing there very quickly again is on outcome planning. So like we're basically, man we're, we're managing these blockchains in a manner that are common assets, right? And then how do we construct gameplay Sorry, how do we actually construct rules that dictate gameplay that result in the outcomes that we want? And so when we're just, when we try to overlay sustainability onto existing games, it doesn't really work because those games, like the rewards are money and profit and people are incentivized to behave in a quadrant of the, of the prisoner's dilemma that does not result in the greatest common good. So those three things very quickly, number one, Sustainability assets are, are different and should be in a different uh, group to me than real assets. Number two, we need to think at scale at the magnitude of the problem in the trillions. And then number three um, is going to be what I just said, which, which uh, what did I just say? But anyway, I'll skip it, you, you heard me. Oh, it's gameplay. It's actually developing gameplay strategy that gets us to the outcome that we want. We'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, thanks. I did that one out. <laughs> I don't know if you want to hop on the mic or, or retro, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just going to follow that up real quickly. You said uh, creating these silo teams that focus on that initiative. What what standards would you uh, encourage that team to have for or to, 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 to keep in mind as they're progressing this, this massive goal? That's a really terrific question because we are, we're having that discussion internally at the moment because we're like, well, uh, on the basis of capability, we're a product team. Although like I've studied, I've studied this uh, academically, I haven't been working in climate mm. throughout my entire life. And so we realized number one is that we need to bring some experts on who have been doing this for their career that they just, they have the tradecraft. And I think tradecraft is actually the key phrase here in that um, <clears throat> like, we, as a community, we talk about like impact and sustainability, but then like begin to segment that out. And it's just a whole diverse set of like discrete and unique assets within that portfolio. Like there's renewable energy and there's microfinance and there's economic, there's all these different things. And then within, let's just say renewable energy, there's solar, there's wind, there's, um, there's geothermal. And then again, like magnify, zoom into just solar there's utility scale solar, there's different forms of, of solar, then there's rooftop solar, there's a variety of other projects, and then overlay that on top of different geographies and different domiciles, you have like different regulatory regimes, different economic incentives. And so when you actually begin to go down this rabbit hole, you realize there really, there cannot feasibly be one central authority that dictates policy. It's kind of like, you know, we, we were thinking about it are like DAOs within DAOs within DAOs within DAOs, which is kind of like committees that are specifically looking at individualized problems. And if I were to think about how to develop a team, at least for us, we realized that we need to have some one or a few people who have on the ground, like hands on experience and trade craft in the major markets in which we're going to participate. And to start, that's definitely going to be carbon credits on the carbon credits app. And then on um, the impact investing for us, that will be microfinance and then on renewable energy. And then I think, um, you know, what you guys have done, which is kind of dissolved the foundation and then move that into a variety of like different stars. And then you create a constellation amongst those, amongst those working groups, right? 
I think that that's the way to do this because the just the general problem problem or like uh, campaign of impact or sustainability is so broad. It's just so broad across different work around product sectors, expertise, geographies, governments, financial applications. So I think like we need to really think at an infrastructure level, like what is necessary to create that foundation to then build on top of it. And that probably last part is that requires collaboration. Like collaboration uh, over, me, over competition. Is there such a thing like the ISO standards for for anything that has to do with clean uh, projects? There are there are several. Some, there are some standards, and we can find some of that information and share them with you. Again, that's um, so. There's a question of like to what degree do we adhere to those standards? And then to what degree do we, we, and I mean, we like the crypto community who are working on this problem, decide that in a way, like we need to, we need to circumvent them if, they, if they're a bit of a, of a blocker. And that's the discussion that's happening right now within carbon credits, whether we try to modernize the certifiers, Vera, Gold Standard, ACR, and others, um, <clears throat> try to bring them on chain and also upgrade their entire systems. Like these are these are nonprofit organizations that are really not technologically advanced at all and don't really have the incentive to be. And they're they're the ones that are holding the keys. Like this is actually a problem of centralized authority um, becoming a bit of a bottleneck. However, I don't want to disparage them because the world desperately needs a central authority and carbon credits to tell us what is the truth. Like which are pro verif verified projects that are actually sequestering carbon and which are, which are not, right? So there needs to be some type of authority giving us a reality check on what is the truth. However, right now that, centra that is centralized on these handful of nonprofits that are very slow and very in expensive and are very non-incentivized to, to modernize and to scale. Nice. Right? So that's also where we're thinking about like consensus, using a consensus mechanism on top of blockchain, but following kind of the standards that are set by the certifiers. It's an ongoing discussion. Yeah, and going back to the carbon credits, uh, for me, something that doesn't click, uh, it feels like rich countries would be paying poor countries to store their crap a bit. Um, so I'm, I mean, I'm probably oversimplifying it, but uh, from, from from the logical point of view, that's that's how it looks like in a very, very basic way. Um, I don't know if I'm totally off the mark there, um, but but yeah, the, the other thing that I would like you to comment on it is that at the end of the day, there's this enforcing factor uh, with carbon. So if uh, some company or government or, or whatnot decides to just go out there and contaminate and ruin the world for everyone else, there's not a clear way to tell them, hey, you need to buy carbon credits, right? They could be like, well, no, there's no law here that forces me to. So is there any way to make that right? You mean, how do we put China in a headlock and <laughs> force them not to just totally raise fart? Just fix the world, Adam. You're saying, right, right. We, we as individuals or as our individual companies just don't have any leverage or, or don't have the leverage on governments. The one, I mean, I'm gonna throw this out there. The one force that has leverage is the market, is the voice of the market. And while we can't stop any individual company or government, let's say, or, gov or, or a government sponsored company, what we can do is we can make it so that carbon is so valuable that the land, that it becomes economically inefficient to remove coal from the ground. That's really what it that that's what needs to happen. Or that protecting the land, protecting the mountain that the coal mine would otherwise blow up, is more is more valuable via its credits and ecosystem credits than it is uh, by extracting the coal. Um, your point though is really your point is really well made, and the enforcement is a bit of an issue. However, we can, we can still do our best. And what we can try to do by creating market, uh, market incentives 
is exactly what Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are doing, right? And that's effectively like putting a market price on privacy and censorship resistance and security and decentralization. And that's like, it's really the meme that Bitcoin is. It's just putting a price on what we've, a we as a community value, and then we're allowing the market to put a price on that. And that asset is now becoming one of the most valuable assets in the world. And it's just, it's the carrot that's bringing everyone else along. Got it. And uh, the presence of the top of the hour coming up, I do want to get to a couple audience questions. Um, Frank, I believe you had a couple if you want to unmute and uh, take over the mic. We'll do a lightning round. Uh, yeah, real quickly, uh, I, I was just wondering how you're going to uh, capture the uh, Oracle price feed, uh, being that I've heard that uh, some of these report, uh, carbon credit market reporting tools are stuck on uh, Web 1.0. And then my second question is with the narrative of, uh, you know, uh, forest offset credits being what I think seems to be the most popular. Uh, are you guys uh, going in that approach uh, and how do you convince uh, the world, world companies out there that they themselves need to reduce emissions uh, to help out with this huge problem. And, and I really appreciate what you're doing, man. So keep it going. Yeah, thanks, Frank. Thanks for the questions. I'll go really fast. So oracles are a major problem, right? They're, they're a problem because, uh, well, for a variety of reasons. And one of them is the fact that ecosystems change, especially when climate change is occurring and the carbon being sequestered in a lot of these plots of land um, that changes over time, particularly in the event of, let's say, a, a wildfire. And after the initial verification, it's very rare for new auditors to go back out to the land and then actually measure the trees, right? So we, we basically need to create new mechanisms for oracular data. And some of those are actually coming online now, like NASA has made available two of its satellites to be rented for um, <clears throat> specifically for um, climate change, sourcing climate change, geospatial data, uh, measuring carbon in brown carbon in the ground, in trees, and then blue carbon that's in oceans. Um, so we can actually get some like very quantifiable information from satellite data. And there are a few companies on the landscape slide. Albo is one of them that are currently doing it. I you know, recommend that you check that out. Um, the other way to do this that's super interesting, and I would love to see somebody build this app on top of us, is um, there are very few people out there who are actually trained in like the, the verification process, going to the plot of land and measuring the trees and then measuring the land, right? <clears throat> and that's like a reason for the delay here is that you need to find Juan and then fly Juan out from Portugal to like Senegal or somewhere to do the measurement. What we ought to be doing is actually training local communities to be able to do this themselves. Right. And there's probably a way to, and there's a way to train them, like finance the training via blockchain, like via crypto, train them online, and then create this global network of experts who are trained to go on site and do the measurement and then have their actual audit verified via consensus online. And we can also verify that through satellite data and other stuff. That to me is like the really exciting idea here is because that also creates jobs. And it's like empowering, um, enfranchising people in their local communities, as well as creating efficiencies for the entire, the entire market. And then very quickly, you said like, how do we force companies? It's hard for us to force, at least in the European Union, well, back to Juan's point, the European Union does have mandatory um, uh, limits on carbon emission or is forcing companies to purchase carbon credits. There are two different carbon credit markets. One is voluntary. The other one is, uh, is mandatory in the European Union. We think that the US will be at some point very soon is going to begin mandating that all public companies in the US start reporting its carbon, uh, its emissions. And then like that will be the lead in to those companies having to either to offset in some manner of speaking. We can't really force companies, but we can incentivize them. Yeah, and I think that's a good segue into to Jack's question as well, if you want to hop cool. on the mic. Yeah, hi. Hi, Adam. Um, hi, I, was, I was taking a look through your website. And I was just wondering where, where does Bitcoin um, see itself fitting in within the ecosystem? Is it a case of you providing your own products, like the carbon uh, credit marketplace that you talked about, or more of like a consultancy role um, to help like implement best practices um, in established projects like Maker? Oh, man, that question cuts deep. 
So <clears throat> well, we realized that, so our mandate here, and we're a Delaware C Corp and again, like in conversations with US regulators so that we can be a compliant entity in the US and to do DeFi compliantly. Our mandate um, is obviously the development and the maintenance of the chain. What we realize is that the application layer, well, the application layer ultimately needs to be built by other entities other than us or the, variety, the various different applications. However, we need to build kind of the fundamental suite of applications just to create the, the piping and then also to show the market what's actually possible. Like we think that what we're doing is gonna bring in like billions and billions of dollars of loans and interest into impact investments and carbon credits because we know that that demand exists. So we need to build that first. Um, we are building the carbon credits um, tool set as well as probably a DEX or we'll just tie into some DEXs and infrastructure that exists uh, on top of Polkadot. And then we'll also build a bridge over to Ethereum. And then we're also gonna build the impact investing marketplace. After that, we'd really like to see other teams um, who wanna design and develop on top of the chain. And then we would, as you said, like be a consultant in best practices. There's also a thought that we kind of replicate what, or we try to replicate what Ethereum had with consensus. And that is for us to seed some type of external dev shop that is aligned with the values and the principles of Bitgreen and our community, but that is completely separate and apart from Bitgreen, the entity. And we would probably seed that entity with, with coins and personnel, but there would be an entirely separate organization that can go out and raise its own equity capital to be a consultancy and to build, and to build products. And then eventually like we envision becoming a, uh, a DAO as MakerDAO had. So having a five year plan or so where we are eventually dissolving the authority of the centralized entity and then having like working, working units kind of these like DAOs within DAOs throughout our organization. But that's, uh, that's more of a long-term objective. And we'd love your help actually in designing it. Awesome. Thank you for the question, Jack. And I think the last one in the queue is from uh, Lewis, if you'd like to hop on the mic. Make it easy. Yep. Wondering how you can, uh, you know, help financing projects instead of just, uh, just uh, helping a more liquid market of already issued carbon credits. Like, because I think the there is a big problem in financing. Uh, like once carbon credits are there, they are, they are here. Like it's not helping financing more projects. And I think yeah, it's particularly that's a interesting for it's particularly interesting for Maker because uh, at the end of the day, that's what we do. <laughs> yeah, that's a really great point. Um, so I I think what you're saying, uh, if I can rephrase it, is the statement that you're making is well by tokenizing existing carbon credits. Well, those projects are already funded. So they're not additional. Like it's not actually, it's not bumping the curve. It's just translating an existing carbon credit in the real world that is illiquid and is not being traced on a registry. So there's double and triple counting and fraud. And we're putting that on chain so it's more liquid, but it's not bringing new financing into projects. And I totally agree. I completely agree with that, that point. Um, so like that is our primary aim here on both the carbon, carbon forward contract, as well as impact investing, that is creating financial mechanisms that bring new additional capital into these markets, right? That's like, that's the real issue at hand is how we do that. And the only way that we, well, there are probably many ways, but the way that we've tried to innovate on and that we've designed is to number one in the carbon forward contract, that is to provide project originators or landowners with an upfront payment on the project so that they can purchase the land, like gain actual um, ownership authority, which I think goes back to Juan's question, which is around enforcement. Like, why can't somebody just go in and slash the rainforest? Well, we need to actually have somebody who we, is in the network has to be able to purchase and have authority of that project. They won't be able to stand up to the Brazilian government in Bolsonaro, but this is a step in the right direction. So we provide them with capital upfront, which is a promissory against the delivery of the future ecosystem credits. And I say ecosystem credits because it's not just carbon, there are also other credits that are generated and then can be sold into the market based on 
um, other ecosystem services and like even um, even endangered animals, endangered species and protection of the ecosystem, right? So we provide the landowner or the project originator with an upfront payment. That's obviously a discounted version of the future carbon credits. They can then take that capital, go through the verification process, which again might cost six figures, low six figures, $100,000, $200,000. They can afford to go through the verification process that then mints the carbon credits. Then they can take the additional capital and go out and then and then basically catalyze other projects. So we have this flywheel effect that builds the compounding effect of providing upfront capital to originators to be able to take their, their first project through the process and then also to be able to take other projects through, through the verification process. And the same is true within, um, obviously within impact investments like renewable energy or microfinance, same thing. Um, and then I think, the, again, the major catalyst, the major, not the catalyst, actually, the multiplier comes down to the secondary market. So how do we create the ability for um, non-primary issuer, non-primary lenders, but then like the real bundlers and the institutions to come in and create like REITs and huge port diversified portfolios of impact assets and carbon credits. Like that's what it's all, but that's what it's all about. Your question is great. Like just creating more liquidity for carbon credits doesn't matter. Those projects are already funded. How do we fund new projects? Yep, uh, thanks. And uh, uh, I think that's, that's what makes you different from other projects I've seen. Cool, thanks. I'm sure they've thought of it too. It's just that this is gonna be like the centerpiece of what we're trying to accomplish. Nice, are there any more questions or, or comments? Adam, is there something that, uh, that you would like to, to say as parting words? Sure. Where, get, where can people up. find you? Uh, email me anytime that you like, adam at bitgreen.org. Um, you would obviously drop an email on the website as well, and then the whole team will read it. Uh, we've been pretty, we've been intentionally stealth and quiet. Uh, so we don't have a Discord channel or a Telegram just yet. Um, although, um, Retro Juan and I have been communicating over Discord in your channel. So I'm actually in your, I take it back. That's actually yes, yes. a great way to communicate. Yeah. I'm in your channel uh, or I'm in your, I'm on your server. And my final thought here that I would like to leave you is like, we, we can only accomplish this objective with friends. Like, we just, we can't do it ourselves as Bickering alone. Like we're going to need to do it with Cello, another layer one and other parties. And like we've contemplated having a carbon stable coin and a lot of the similar ideas of what you guys have and others. And I would be more than happy, like I'll raise my hand right now to be able to do like to divide and conquer. There's a division of labor of like, we are focused on what we do really well, which is really providing, creating these new impact investing marketplaces and DeFi tools and allowing like, the maker community to create diversified pools of is like a green dye, if you will, that is collateralized and pegged to real world assets that are impactful. And I think that we're going to, like we will definitely get there in the next three years. The question is just what is the size and the scope and the ubiquity of those pools? And then how do we compete against a, compete not against, but in a crypto community that right now is very driven by profit taking, you know, and making a quick buck. And I think if we do this together, then we role model for the world that sustainability and impact investing as an asset class can play with the big boys. And we can do it in the, and we can do it collaboratively and we can do it in the right way. And other people will follow us if we do it right. I think that's, that's the goal is to be in that way, like, the North Star or the or the beacon on the hill. That gives a lot of other people hope. Awesome. Well, thank you, Adam, for that excellent presentation, providing great background as well as insight into Bitgreen's mission. Uh, the team here at Maker is happy to help. And uh, as a follow-up, we'll post your contact information into the forum yeah. post as well as a replay of the video uh, for anyone to follow up. And uh, I'm sure you'll be getting a couple pings uh, over the next uh, coming days for uh, support. So uh, thank you yeah, everyone for joining. Awesome. Yeah.
Thank you. And the more that we have this conversation and the more that you guys have this conversation, it organizes resources, right? I'm and sorry. that's what's in thoughts. And that's what's really critical here is providing a venue for this that's not like some party in the street in Glasgow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See ya. All right. Thanks, Bye. guys.